Um, got it. Um, so I'm going to talk just kind of a throughout the seasons. Here's where I fish kind of thing. So this is just uh, one person's take on how to fish the driftless. Um, so this, I don't know, I like this photo. This was 1999. I uh, just had my 50th the other day, so it's been a while. Um, so I'm a lecturer at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. So I teach in biology. My background is fisheries ecology and management. So I did my master's and PhD in West Virginia. And I've been fishing the driftless for, I don't know, over 30 years, including uh, the last day of the year we got out. And then my little COVID project, so kind of why I'm sure Jerry asked, other than we've been on the TU Dare stuff a little bit together too, is the, so I published this blog, the Scientific Fly Angler. It's just kind of been a fun little screwing around thing since COVID and I've kept it up. So, um, so a lot of this comes from there. So these are posts about hatches for the driftless and um, sort of things like that. So flies that I like. Um, my favorite fly in the world, CDC and elk. I probably fish it, oh, 50% of the time in a year or close to it. Um, and what I kind of want to do tonight is um, just kind of share experiences and kind of here's how I do things or here's what I like to do. Um, Kind of think about what you might be tying for tying season. I know I haven't tied a whole lot lately, but I'll get back into it here. And, you know, maybe a little conversation, a little discussion about like what things that you've had work or ask about why I've kind of done it this way. And I'll just kind of break it into um, winter, early season. This is probably my least favorite time to fish, but, uh, you know, at least you're outside which is usually a pretty good thing. Um, although there's been some pretty miserable days out there. Um, so, you know, kind of leeches and deep stuff and little tiny flies is kind of winter. Um, spring, which I always think about, I'll talk about the granum hatch is kind of really the, the real start of fly fishing season in my mind. They start rising and that's what I like. And then kind of late summer into fall and kind of how things change. Um, I always, you know, this where question is kind of, I think, the least interesting question. So this is 30 miles from Viroqua. And I just, in GIS, drew a little circle. This is uh, the Wisconsin trout tool thing. And, I mean, it takes you into Minnesota and Iowa and covers all, I mean, there are thousands of, couple thousand miles of trout streams and just, 30 mile as a crow flies from Viroqua. And I know that I have not fished all of them because the last day of trout season, Mike Coor and I, who some of you probably know Mike from the, he was a Wisconsin State Council Chair. He and I fished two streams that we've never fished before. We had to go to Monroe County to do it, but, uh, but we did. So, you know, there is not a spot. There's nothing magic about any of the streams. It's just kind of figuring out what streams work at different times and where to go and, a lot of that, I think, is just kind of trial and error. So just go fish. Um, so I always think this one's kind of one that I, so before I get into the rest, just thinking about what I always think about is, like, if I'm having a bad day, if things aren't working, I try something different, right? Maybe I usually, because I'm a dry fly snob, I will start with dry flies. And if that's not working, I will grudgingly put on a nymph. Then maybe I'll put on a streamer or something like that. But you know, change things up. I would say change things big. Like if I'm fishing a big stream and it's not working, I go to a small stream. If I've been on a smaller stream, maybe I'm going to try something bigger and different. Um, Kind of the shaded or more open. Sometimes when the, it's really sunny, the really open places don't fish that well. Sometimes early in the season, the really open places do fish well. So it's kind of thinking about kind of what effect it has on water temperature. And of course, the trout don't have eyelids. So they they're kind of at the mercy of the sun. Um, I've kind of saw some cool stuff in a few places where streams that flow east-west versus north-south get really different vegetation and stuff growing in them. And sometimes just changing that matters. Um, when you fish is a huge deal. So fish late, get up early, try something midday, especially early in the season. I'm fishing midday. I like midday a lot in 
summer as well because I like fishing grasshoppers and they don't get up too terribly early. Um, and then of course, you know, not every day can be a winner. So, you know, grab a beer and a book. This, uh, maybe you recognize the West Fork Sports Club there in the background, but you know, every once in a while that happens too. We're reading a book is maybe and having a bit burger is maybe a little preferable to fishing. This was a really hot, miserable day as I remember. Um, so kind of into the meat of this talking about, um, early season. So I think kind of January through maybe early March ish is kind of early season, maybe even through March, depending on the year. Um, I'm fishing lots of streamers and leeches. I'm fishing little tiny nymphs and midge larvae and scuds are always a really good bet. And you know, every once in a while we get some dry flies too. Usually midges and those little winter stone flies that maybe you see, they even, they'll even be on the snow and ice. Um, and every once in a while you get a little sun and it perks them up and, you know, you may have 15 minutes, a half hour of activity on a dry fly and that can be kind of fun and different. So this is the venerable Milwaukee leech. I am sure that if you have been to the Driftless Angler, you have seen this, the, this, the downtown leech, which is just the tungsten bead. Um, my friend Todd Durian, who had passed away here a year and a half ago, or just about a year ago, um, he was one of the first to try this. It worked so well that the next year he bought from Matt and Jerry a gross, so 144 dozen, or uh, sorry, 144, so 12 dozen of these things, and went through pretty much all of them. So this is a really great fly. This is one I think I tied. I can kind of tell by the fact that I put a big old hackle on it. Sometimes I don't do that. And I put a smaller one. I just kind of mess around with tying them in different ways. But this Milwaukee leech, I don't, there's something about it. It's got that little bit of red. It's got this, this Arizona semi-seal uh, dubbing. And it's kind of translucent-ish. And it just seems to really work. It's got a little flash, but it's not overdone. Um, it's just, it is probably my number one winter fly. Other things that I like. Uh, I just tie some woolly buggers. I tie some big ones that I call like a spay bugger. I'm essentially using a spay hackle as the as the hackle on them. Um, so they're really big and webby and and flowy, if that's a word. Um, my friend, I don't know, maybe some of you know Ben Lubchansky, a good friend of mine. Um, he has the jiggy and itty meaty things. And it's just a little leech. And he's put a lot of thought into kind of how and why it works and it jigs a little bit better, especially the jiggy version, uh, jigs a little bit better and kind of gets that up and down movement like a real leech does. And then if I wanna go something bigger, I'm usually fishing like a little sculpin imitation or something like that. Those are kind of the, you know, we don't have a ton of diversity of of minnows in our streams. We do have sculpin, that's kind of the, the probably the most common bait fish. Um, Zebra midges. So this is an image I just took off the Driftless Angler website. Um, simple, you know, black, tan, red, so blood worms. Other small nymphs work as well, but the zebra midge is just a really simple, that big cone gets it down, or the, the bead gets it down. It looks like a little midge. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't take much to, it's not terribly fancy, but they tend to work. So anything, anything that gets you to the bottom tends to work pretty well in the winter. Um, scuds. So this is from some research stuff that I've done. Um, so this is what's cool about scuds is they're there all the time. There is, if you've ever taken bug samples in our streams, there are huge, huge amounts of scuds. So if you look at all these insects, or I should say not insects, but all of these macroinvertebrates in here, you know, we got some caddis and stuff, quite a few of those, but an awful lot, a whole big percentage of the biomass are these scuds. Um, I tend to fish them mostly on cloudy days and then early and late in the day. So they like, they don't like sun, they like it darker. So they're a lot more active when it's, uh, when it's cloudy. Um, they're swimmers. So this is one of the things I think that people don't always take advantage of is understanding that scuds are going to move. I catch a, so I don't fish them a ton because I'd rather not, I'd rather have a dry fly on, but when I do fish them, I'm moving them just a little bit, one inch, maybe four inches at the most. 
move it, and then just let it kind of fall. And I find almost always when fish hit, they're going to hit it on the strike. So, you know, we've all learned to dead drift our nymphs. Well, for scuds, because they are swimmers, some kind of one of the other common names for them is a side swimmer. Um, they move. So make your fly move. And that, I think, helps a ton. And, um, and then we get a little bit of dry fly. So this is an old kind of a caddisy stonefly pattern that I've tied, little turkey biot wing. Um, we get some winter stone flies, so kind of long, thin little things. We get some midges, and, you know, it's not much else going on. Although I have, I know people that will try to catch a fish every single month of the year on a hippie stomper, and they're often fairly successful. So you just got to kind of pick your spots. And probably a lot of you recognize where this is already. Um, this was January 3rd this year. So my friend Chris wanted to go out and get out really early. It was a miserable, miserable cold day. I froze my butt off. So a lot of times in the winter, I tie flies instead, read a book, probably should have put a drink, a little whiskey on there, be another good one. Um, and enjoy not freezing my butt off. So I, I'll fish in the winter, but I, I'm definitely picking my spots and I am not going to go out on January 3rd again, if it looks anything like it did this year. Um, and then we start kind of transitioning to spring. Water temperatures are rising. The fish get a little bit more active, right? Cold-blooded organisms get a little more active when the water warms up. We've gotten rid of the snow. That's always a huge thing because in the winter, when we when we have snow on the ground and it starts to melt, then the stream temperatures tend to go down and that can be kind of a depression on the fish activity. So once we get rid of most of that snow and we're just starting to green up a little bit, so here's kind of earlier spring, here's a little bit later. Um, and uh, the bug activity starts picking up a little bit too. And here's kind of, this is a, this is just a downstream end of the West Fork campground if you're familiar with that. So that's that hill that sees branches back here. Um, I start finding the first place that fish move to is those tails of the pool. So they get warmed up a little bit more quickly than anything else. Fish start using those. Those fish are really hard to get at. You got to cast from below them and not hit the riffle. So you're casting over the grass a lot of times, but at least at that time of the year, there's not much grass or you're getting above them and casting down to them. Um, you, uh, so they start moving into riffles a little bit later. And that's typically, if they're in riffles to me, that's when fish are active. So if they're in a riffle, they're there to feed. And I usually do really well in those. Matter of fact, I, I think I do, you know, I fish a lot of these riffles that a lot of people just walk by. And if you throw a nymph through them, especially, they will often, you will catch fish in places you would never, never think there is a fish. And then by the middle of April, usually is about what I think of it as the granum hatch starts. And that's really kind of the, so, 15th or so of April, maybe a little earlier, maybe a little later, depending on the year, but that tends to be the granum caddis hatch. And that's kind of, to me, kind of the best, probably the best dry fly fishing of the year. Um, and I think of it as kind of the real fishing season because from that point on, I am probably not putting on a nymph if I don't have to. Um, that's just kind of my preference. So this in the background is a CDC and elk. This is a Hans Weilandman fly. Um, if I could only fish one day out of the year, I'd pick one of the first really good days of the Granum Hatch. So again, kind of keep an eye on the weather. The water temps get around 50-ish or so, high 40s or so, and uh, the Granum Caddis start hatching. So they're a little case caddis. Um, you can find online, Tom Logger did a really great presentation all about the Granum. Um, so he's a central Wisconsin guy and he did a really great um really great job on that and it's a you know it is i think in the driftless area it is really our best hatch so i i try to get that one every year that is kind of the one i shoot for um and then blueing olives are kind of the other big it's kind of our mayfly hatches in my experience have been definitely on the decline we don't have the sulfurs we used to have you pretty much can't find a hendrickson anymore but the blue wing olives still do pretty well. 
And again, I'm looking for kind of rainy, cloudy days. Their sizes are anywhere from like a 16 is on the really big side. I'm usually fishing an 18 or a 20. And, you know, as small as a 26 or even smaller, if you can, if you, if you can do that, if you have interest in doing that, especially a little small late in the fall, really small ones, 26s and 28s. Um, crane fly. So here's a post. I'm not going to link to it, but uh, you can search the, the, the scientific fly angler site and you'll find a post about crane flies um it's kind of become i think one of our best our more dependable hatches um it tends to be kind of a midday thing um timing varies a lot so this year it was off a little bit um but usually through kind of may through june is when i expect them we get kind of a yellow one and we get an orange one those kind of typically you know, size 16 tends to cover those pretty well. Um, and it's really just kind of the egg laying adults that are coming back. So again, because they're egg laying adults, they're actively, they're actively flying. Same with the granums. And I am twitching my fly like crazy during these things a lot of times. So I'll try dead drift once in a while, but a lot of times I'm making a short little cast, having a fly that has something that it can help skitter it with. So this is kind of a clip tackle thing and i'm just kind of twitching my rod tip and a lot of times that movement is what's going to get a fish to hit because they're used they're used to seeing a move um and then of course by this kind of by may 1st or so i'm thinking uh andrew grillos's hippie stomper is like it he's a he made this in colorado or produce you know thought of this fly in colorado on the gunnison but um it is the perfect driftless terrestrial. I mean, it's why they, they use so many of them here. I know when he was in, so this was from the Bad Axe Country Club. Um, if you've never been, you need to go. It's kind of a cool little place, but he was tying flies. He sells, they sell more hippie stompers, basically the driftless than they do everywhere else in the U.S. combined pretty much. Um, and then small nymphs. So, um, I don't get too concerned about nymphs. Nymphs are nymphs. I want something that gets down deep. Um, so I like, you know, so small and slim help get it down deep fast. Uh, so this is a brush hog. This is a, this one I have a ton of success with. This is off the Driftless Angler page. I usually tie mine a little bit differently than this, but I like this idea of, I don't bother with the tail because crane flies don't have a tail, um, but a little bit of purple in the body. And then a and then a little bit light to dark thing on the from the abdomen to the thorax tends to work really well. Um, and then the other one looks like some kind of pheasant tail variation. And I know there's about seven billion different names of nymphs, but most of them aren't all that terribly different. Um, so just this one's got a little purple hot spot, probably a pretty good crane fly imitation as well, probably a little mayfly. I don't think fish get too terribly concerned about like, oh. Gee, am I hitting a crane fly or something else? Um, they're kind of hitting what they see. And then like pertagons or anything, just anything that gets deep fast. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with the great Hank Patterson or not, but um, I'm fairly agnostic about dry and dropper. I know tons of people think that that's like the greatest way to fish and there's some advantages to it, but you're also, I always think you're never fishing the dry fly as well as you could. And you're never really fishing the nymph quite as well as you could. So there are definitely times where I take one of them off and fish just the one because I think I I think I can fish it more effectively, fish it better. Um, and I'm a dry fly snob, so the you know this bobber stuff and definitely this euro nymph thing. I hear if you buy a euro nymph rod, you you get one of these fish counters with it. Yeah, not really my thing, but you know if you're into that, so be it. Um. By middle, so getting into summer, this is honestly summer has become my favorite time to fish. Um, and in large part because we just have this amazing, amazing terrestrial fishery. This was probably the best year for grasshoppers we have had in almost since I can remember. I mean, it was just fantastic. So this is a Moorish hopper. I've got the cutters and I make all kinds of these. Um, this is what I, for lack of a better word, I just call it my cricket. Um, but it's just a little dub body. It's going to get a little wet. 
It's got a wing to it. It's got a little deer hair bullet head. And then I've got a little piece of um, foam on it just so I can see it. But I think the real thing that does it is just those, I'm a big sucker for rubber legs on flies. I think they really, they work really well. Um, so this Morris hopper, I'll kind of fish anywhere. This My Cricket thing floats really low. It's great for water that's really still, like I mean excruciatingly still sometimes. It's not going to be a real high floater, but it's going to pick up some of the pickier fish. And I call it a cricket, but I think it's as much a beetle as it is a cricket. I mean, I'm again, I don't think fish are like, oh, gee, that's a that's a cricket, not a beetle. I'm not going to hit it. It looks like food. They hit it. I mean, the hippie stomper doesn't look like anything in particular, and they hit that like crazy. And so this was a fun one. This was a photo from a day that I fished uh, a stream near lacrosse here. And this fly had caught, and it's pretty beat up by now. I think I'd caught 30, 30 to 40 fish by the time I ended. I fished 100, maybe 150 meters of stream. They were just on hoppers like, like crazy. Um, one thing I did with this Moorish hopper, and I've had really good luck lately, is I put this on a big clink hammer hook. So it gets the hook down in the water a little bit more. And I think my hookups have been a little bit better. I think anytime you fish a hopper, you're going to, you're going to miss fish. Fish are going to miss your fly. You're going to miss fish. Um, so I think that's helped a little bit. Um, you know, chernobyl -y thing. So here's a brook trout um, caught on this little, so this is a fiberglass rod, which is just a ton of fun to, when you're going to catch small fish, put them on a fiberglass rod where they're, they're really going to put some bend into it. And just a simple little Chernobyl type fly. Again, rubber legs, I think just do a lot. And uh, it was a really fun day catching pretty decent brook trout. Um, and then every once in a great, great while. So this is, I think, a training wheels or a Chernobyl hopper or whatever from, I bought at the Driftless Angler. I know this isn't one I tied. Um, so Western monstrosities, I think um, generally around here, smaller is better. If nothing else, this thing is a really attractive bobber. But why I took this photo, I remember I was on Timber Cooley. I was, you know, at one of the most popular places on Timber Cooley. It had just a little bit of stain in the water. And I thought, oh, dry and dropper will work really well today. I caught three to one on the dry fly to the dropper. So they were just, they saw that big thing. The water was just a little bit turbid. And for whatever reason, that was what they were looking for. Maybe they didn't see the little nymph behind it so well because it was turbid. Um, but I had a heck of a day just on this ugly thing. Um, and then I always carry a few truss rows that are a little more subtle. So just a simple little foam beetle kind of thing. Um, again, they're going to look up at it. It doesn't matter what the underbody is too much. Normally I put a little peacock or something. This was just a real quick and dirty one. Um, and then this kind of a version of a bionic ant, which is one of my favorite little patterns. I fish this in black. I fish it in purple and I fish it in pink. I have no idea why pink and purple work just as well as black do, but some days it actually works better. It's again, I think the rubber legs, the little bit of white on the wing, just so you see it really well. Um, it's a simple, simple killer little fly. Little white on the head, you can see it pretty well. It's I really like that a lot. Um, so I think the most common thing I see people do is we, a lot of people fish hoppers that are too big. I would, oh well, trust rules in general, but especially hoppers. You know those big things that people fish out west. We don't tend to have grasshoppers like that around here. If you kind of walk through the grass and you're seeing grasshoppers. I would say like, what, three quarters of an inch to an inch and a quarter is kind of the size of most of the hoppers. So I tend not to go much larger than that very often. Um, I kind of like different flies for different waters. So I'm thinking about kind of match the hatch thing a little bit. And on flat water, I'm maybe not fishing that grasshopper. I may be fishing a little ant instead. I'm fishing that cricket that I that I showed you instead. Um, and then I think this is kind of one of the other things is we, you know, we love fishing hoppers cause they're awesome and the fish explode on them, but kind of think about what's around. So if you're in a, if you're in a heavily grazed pasture, there's not gonna be a lot of grasshoppers. I tend to fish a cricket there because 
crickets tend to be associated with the open ground a little bit more. And I think I just see a lot more crickets in those places and, and a lot fewer grasshoppers. And this is a little pattern I've been messing around with. Um, I kind of talk about it later. So this was, this was a great year for hoppers. I saw, I have never seen as many hoppers as I saw this year, I think. It was just fantastic. And I caught, I, I would guarantee I caught a few hundred fish on grasshoppers this year. It was, it was pretty amazing. Um, I think one of the big things to do is, you know, those overgrazed pastures, the Bohemian Valley, right? That's kind of the one that tons of us love to fish because it's nice and wide open. Not a great grasshopper place. I'm going for the places where it's rotationally grazed or maybe no grazing at all, where you got big, tall vegetation. And that's where you're going to find hoppers because they need they need food, right? Um, I don't do a ton of this, but um, so night fishing, mice, and some of the bigger uh, streamers. So something that's going to push a little bit of water so they feel it, I think, is a is a big thing. Um, I definitely don't do a ton of this. I just love this one, uh, mini McMouse face, right? So I thought that was a cool looking pattern, so I threw it in there. Again, driftless angler, um, carry stuff like that. Streamers, I'll, every once in a while, I will just like decide to grab my six weight instead and throw big stuff. So here's a magic minnow. This is kind of a cool little pattern I found on the online years ago that it's kind of a Scandinavian perch pattern but I've tied it to look like brown trout and stuff like that. I've done pretty well on it. You can totally mess around with the, the flash, how much flash you want in it. Um, you know, here's kind of a muddlerish fly. I'll fish something like this on a, uh, on a sinking leader. So those poly sink leaders, and then that'll sink a little bit lower and your fly will ride a little higher. And when you move it, it'll kind of bob a little bit and they can work really well. Um, yeah. And then other stuff I'm carrying, like soft tackles, I think are, I know I don't fish them as much as I should, um, but I think they're really great. And there's a lot of times where fish are looking for movement. So swinging a soft tackle tends to really work. And I'm always kind of amazed that like sometimes I'm fishing a nymph, I'm trying to dead drift it. And then when I do something to move it, all of a sudden fish are hitting. Um, so I try to emulate that a little once I pick that up. I know people that fish nothing but a past lake. Um, Bethke's pink squirrel, right? So a lot of people, to me, it's kind of a scud imitation, probably also a case caddis. Tons and tons of people, you know, fish those. It's not, those aren't two flies I tend to fish a ton, but for lots of people, that's things that they really like. Uh, Duke, I know, has got, you know, this toe biters. And I've had a friend of mine that just caught a couple of fish and kept them. And he said their stomachs were just loaded with toe biters. So they're a little underwater hemipteran, a little, uh, um, or fairly good size, really uh, underwater uh, insect. Um, and then just, you know, playing around. I think part of the fun of fly tying, if you're a fly tire, is you can tie to do all kinds of things. So this is uh, Dr. J's X legs, a pattern that I started screwing around with. I was just looking for a trestrel that floated low, that didn't ride up so high in the water, that kind of got in. So I put it on a clink hammer hook. It's got it's got rubber legs because so I think rubber works really well and moves in the water nicely. And then I just find a little way to float it. So foam on some, just deer hair on others, a little CDC on some. And then like the Milwaukee leech, I have tied it in like 7 billion different ways. You know, rubber legs on it, with flash, without flash, mess around with the hackle, don't put the hackle on, just tons of different, you know, kind of the fun of fly tying to me is that you can, Make whatever you want. Um, so on that theme, right? So we're playing around. So pink parachutes. I don't. I have no idea why this works, but my kind of standard fly for when I don't know what's happening, but I want to fish a dry fly. I'm either fishing a CDC and elk, or I'm probably grabbing a pink parachute. Um, so these I put on a clink hammer hook, just kind of I don't know pink hammers, something like that. Um, and with rubber legs. So I found a way to just see, I don't think I've had a chance to fish these yet, but I thought, you know, let's see if maybe if I put a little rubber legs on these, maybe it'll look kind of midsummer terrestrially or something. And I'll give that a try next year. Um, here is my 
Uh, I don't know. This just bothered the heck out of me this year. So don't be an idiot. Um, carry a thermometer. Warm streams are going to fish for crap anyways. So um, I, I'm always amazed that I, the West Fork of the Kickapoo, right? So I camp out at the West Fork quite a bit. I'm on the board out there at the West Fork Sports Club. This was after it passed through three riffles. It was 72 and a half degrees in middle of kind of middle-ish of June. This was at the women's clinic a couple of years ago. Above the riffles, it was like 79. You're not going to catch fish in there. Yet I'll see people fish stuff like that. So, um, and if you do catch anything, you're probably going to kill it. So carry a thermometer. This thing cost me $20 or less. I carry it in my car. I bought it because it had a bottle opener on it. So I've always got a bottle opener with me. Um, and then as we move into fall, typically, you know, we're not real, we're not dealing with water temperatures so much. We're getting cool nights and stuff. This is Mike fishing a hole on Rulin Schoolie that no longer exists because the stream has moved yet again in one of the floods. Um, so I always think fall is kind of a mix of spring and summer. So we still get the terrestrials, still the little nymphs and stuff like that. I'm fishing a leech a little bit more again. And the great thing about fall is you start getting these blooming olives again, pretty good. Every once in a great while, a little kind of caddis hatch as well. But blooming olives, I'd say, is kind of the fall is probably my favorite and the best time to fish them. The problem is that they tend to be really small at this time. Um, and then just kind of to show what uh, this is something I donated to Cooley Region. Um, but this is kind of a fly box that I would carry. Like if I had one in a shirt pocket and I was going fishing for the day, I might carry something like this where I've got some bigger buggery things. I've got some leeches. I've got some little tiny nymphs. I've got a couple of soft tackles here. I've got a cricket, some hoppers. I've got some of these pink parachutes are kind of what these things are, or different, different parachutes. I've got like a Madam EX thing. I've got my cricket. Um, I've got a bunch of CDC and outs. I've got a bunch of those little caddis flies and a beetle. And, you know, so kind of midsummer, this is maybe what I'm carrying. And I would feel pretty confident if I had those flies for a day, I could probably find a way to catch some fish. Um, and here just kind of, this was a really fun one. This was, uh, <laughs> this is my friend, Ben. So I don't know if you know Kyle Zempel from Black Earth Angling Company, if any of you have fished with Kyle. I was, he saw this photo once and he's like, I know who that hairy little guy is right away. So that's Ben's arm. And this is a fish that he had netted for me. Um, caught on one of those Moorish hoppers way upstream on a, on a really popular stream. Um, so kind of the, you know, thinking about stuff, you know, planning for the rest of the season, I fly by the seat of my pants. I just kind of decide what I'm going to tie when I feel like tying it. I uh, just the back here behind me, I've got, I don't know, three dozen musky flies hanging up. I've never cast for musky. I've never fished for musky. They're just fun to play around with. Um, but otherwise, you know, if I'm kind of filling the holes in the season, I'm, you know, I'm tying the stuff I fish all the time, CDC and elks and some of those hoppers again and things like that. Um, I'm not, yeah, I'm not much for planning and making a list. I wish I had that discipline, but I just kind of do it more for fun. I did a little bit of commercial tying. I tied for the Driftless angler, angler a couple of times and enough to know that I do not like commercial tying. So uh, kind of didn't do much for me. So this is, you know, kind of me playing around with stuff. Here's a bunch of jigs I tied, some, you know, bunches of other stuff. Um, I got more flies than I know what to do with. So here's kind of my last little spiel is uh, Cooley region. So us here in the Cooleys, if, you come up and fish this way and you want to donate some flies or the Wisconsin TU banquet is back on again this year. So if you're a fly tired and you got more stuff than you know what to do with. So these are all things I donated to Cooley region last year. So kind of a universal fly box. Uh, this is a double-sided one. There's stuff on the other side, bunches of big streamers and stuff just to, you know, I have more flies than I know what to do with. So I give them to somebody else. Um, if you guys have a banquet and look for that, let me know. I'm happy to send some down as well. Um, and then, I don't know, just a little reading. Start your own blog. So my, uh, so a little plug, Scientific Fly Angler. Just kind of a fun little thing playing around with. And I don't know, I think it's, hopefully it's been interesting to people. And I 
I will have everywhere from three dozen people read a story to, you know, a couple of thousand, depending on kind of what it is and, and where it is. So that's kind of been my fun little thing to mess around with when I'm not fishing or tying flies or, or of course working. So, um, so that was kind of my spiel. I hope I did okay on time. <laughs>